Romans 3, we're in trouble. The trains are running late this morning, but God's going to help us. I'm going to talk fast. You listen fast, and uh, we'll get the word of the Lord in. 2 Thessalonians 3, and begin reading at verse 1 with me. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be honored just as it was with you, and that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you will do the things that we've commanded you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. All right, I shared last week on a tough passage, and uh, I got another tough passage this week. I said, Lord, I'm going to go back to the Gospels, because Jesus is a lot easier. But I want you to look with me in verse 6, because we have some hard words to talk about this morning. Look with me. But we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in everything. The Lord be with you all. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Father, that your word would come, that the entrance of your word would bring light, and that you'd breathe life among us. In Jesus' name, if your heart agrees, say amen and amen. Quite a few years ago, my nephew and my niece were visiting us from Chicago. So Denise and I decided to take the train into the city and show them some of the sights around New York City, only we forgot that little legs don't last very long in the city. My, my nephew was 10 and my little niece was about six at the time. And before we got very far, my niece just couldn't keep up with us. She's just a little tiny feather of a thing. She's a senior in college now and she's still very, very tiny. So I picked her up and I put her on my shoulders and we went on. And at first, I hardly noticed the extra weight, but after a little while, my neck started tingling in the back. And then my shoulders started aching, and then my lower back started to twinge, and then I started perspiring, and then I started panting. And before we got too much further, we said, taxi, come and save us. You know, it's not too difficult to carry someone for a short while. But it's quite another thing to carry someone for a long distance, even a little someone. As members of God's family, there are times when we all need to be carried. There are times that we all need the, the prayers of the saints, that we need their encouragement, that we need their personal support when we're struggling, when we're going through stress or sickness or sorrow. We need them to lend an ear, to give us counsel. Maybe we even sometimes need them to help meet a practical need, even give us financial assistance. I'm going to tell you, I thank God for his family on earth. Denise and I, honestly, we do not know what we would do without the church. I don't know what I would have done when I was 16 and my dad left us on my 16th birthday. I don't know what we would have done if it hadn't been for the support of the family of God. There have been times that they have carried us, and I am so thankful. But you know, over the long haul, everyone must learn how to carry himself. Each of us have to learn how to walk in Christ with endurance, and we want to grow strong so that we're there to help carry someone else who's coming up behind us who needs our help. We've come to the very last page of Paul's letters to the church in Thessalonica. 
When Paul picked up his pen and he began to write to those new believers, he did something that had never been done before. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he began to write a letter from heaven. A letter used by God to speak to believers everywhere, in every generation. We've walked through First and Second Thessalonians, and now looking at the last page of this letter, I hear a word from the Holy Spirit about being a blessing and not a burden. There was a man named Jabez whose mother had a very hard time in labor, and when he was born, she named him What a Pain. But Jabez cried out to God and he said, God, I don't want to be a pain anymore. I don't want to cause anyone pain. I want you to bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. And I want to tell you, that's my cry too. I don't want to be a pain anymore. I don't want to cause anyone pain. I don't want to be a burden. I want to be a blessing. As I look at Paul's words here, I see five keys to being a blessing, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Five keys to being a blessing and not a burden. The first one is this, get in step with God's family. Get in step with God's family. Paul uses a lot of military words in these two letters, and one of them is right here in these verses. It's the words walking disorderly. If you're reading out of the NIV Bible this morning, it translates those word idle, and, and that doesn't really capture Paul's meanings. The New King James that I read out of is a better translation here. And the picture is of a soldier who is not in step with the rest of his unit. He's out of line. He can't keep time marching with the rest of the unit, what we might call a flat foot. In the military, they actually have a term for it. They call it a gaggle march. He's undisciplined. He's a goof-off. He's a disgrace to the unit. He's a frustration to his officers, like Gomer Pyle, if you go back that far, or Private Benjamin, or Bill Murray in Stripes, or Beetle Bailey, if you're a comic strip fan. You know, that makes for good entertainment, but in real life, it's not so funny. Such a soldier is a hindrance to the unit and a danger to his fellow soldiers in battle. And beloved, I want to tell you, believers who are out of step with God's family are the same. They're a hindrance at best and a danger at worst. They are a burden and not a blessing. And that's not what we want to be. We don't want to be gaggle marchers. We want to be blessings and not a burden. Don't be a gaggle march. One thing I see here is that you need to get in step with the apostolic tradition. There's another military term that Paul uses here. It's the word command. He said, we have confidence that you're going to do the things we have commanded. We command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus. That word command means an order that has been given by the highest ranking officer and has come down through the chain of authority until it is announced to all of the troops. Beloved, I want to tell you the instructions that Paul gives us in the word of God, the instructions that the apostles give us in the word of God they are not just good suggestions they're not just helpful hints for Christian living they are authoritative orders from heaven from Jesus the captain of the host earlier Paul wrote you welcomed our message not as the word of men but as it really is the word of God beloved I want to tell you it's important that we know what the apostles taught it's important that we know what they taught about Jesus and about salvation through faith, about the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit, about Christian life and about eternal life and about Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's important that we know how believers down through history have understood the apostles' words and applied them to their lives and that we stay in step with those believers. Beloved, listen, our call is not to stay in step with changing culture. Our call is not to step away from orthodox faith and practice, though some might. Our call is to stay in step with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Don't be a gaggle march. Get in step with your leaders. Paul said, follow us. We were not disorderly among you, but we toiled day and night. We left you with that example. Follow your leaders in their passion for the things of God in their love for Jesus, in their love for the moving of the Holy Spirit, in their love for the Word of God and the Gospel. Follow your leaders in their focused Christian living. 
in their godly self-control, in their circumspect lifestyle, in their relentless pursuit of the Christian disciplines. Follow your leaders in their sacrificial love for the church. Paul says here that he waived his rights. He was entitled to receive financial support from the Thessalonians, but he didn't receive that financial support simply for the sake of being a good example to them. He loved the church sacrificially. Can I tell you, I am so thankful for the fathers and mothers in the faith who left a good example for me. You know, most of them are home with the Lord now, but before they went home, they left me with a goal to reach for. They were people of great faith. They were men and women of the Spirit. They were sold out for Jesus. They were overflowing with the love of God. They were wise and good and gentle but firm. And I want to be like them. I want to aspire to the example that they left for me. Don't be a gaggle march. Get in step with the cadence of our congregation. Paul said to the Thessalonians, there were some people walking among them who were not necessarily of them. They weren't in step. They weren't in sync. They, they weren't simpatico with the rest of the congregation. You know, sometimes we find that's the case too. Sometimes we find people walking among us who simply can't seem to settle down. They don't have peace with the leaders. They don't have peace with the teaching or the worship. They don't have peace with our ministries or with the rules of this house. Doesn't mean that they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. It simply means they're not in step with what God is doing here. I like what one of my heroes, Jack Hayford, says. He says, you need to know that you're living in the right country, that you're living in the right state, that you're living in the right city, that you're worshiping in the right church, and that you're serving in the right ministry. Beloved, if God has called you to Harvest Time Church, if he's called you to this family, then get in step with the cadence of this congregation. God has called us to be a house of answered prayer for all nations. He's called us to be a house of worship in the freedom of the Spirit. We believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a good gift that's available to every believer. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe God still speaks to his church through the voice of prophecy. God has called us to be a light to the nations. You know, the United Nations was supposed to be built here in the late 40s on this piece of property and that didn't happen and this piece of property sat empty and nobody was allowed to buy it for 50 years until we came along and God gave us this land because he intended for there to be another model community to the world here, the Church of Jesus Christ. If God has called you to be part of our family, don't be a gaggle marcher. Get in step with us. Five keys to being a blessing and not a burden. You doing all right? Yeah. All right, good, because now I'm coming for you, so fasten your seatbelts and it'll get better at the end, all right? Number two, five keys to being a blessing and not a burden. Secondly, work on yourself rather than working the phones. Work on yourself rather than working the phones. Paul uses a play on words he, um, in the original language that the English doesn't quite capture. He says, they're not only not working, but they're working against the unity of the body. Or, or I like to put it this way, they're not only not working, but they're working the phones. Ever have somebody call you who was working the phones? I remember years ago, I got a phone call out of the blue from a girl that had been in the college and career group in my home church. I went off to Bible college to study for ministry. She joined a small group that was actually led by a, a distant cousin of mine, a second cousin, twice removed, however that works. And uh, he left our home church. And when he left our home church, that, that small group left the church with him. And I hadn't seen or spoken to this girl in several years, but she called me out of the blue one night and she started making small talk with me. And then she said to me, she said, Bob is a cousin of yours, isn't he? And I said, well, yes, he is. And she said to me, what do you think of him? And all of a sudden, my antenna went up in the air. And I said, well, you know, I haven't seen him in a while, but he's a great Bible teacher. And then she said, well, do you want to know what he thinks about you? And all of a sudden, I knew she was working the phones. See, she was trying to drag me into the middle of some kind of battle that wasn't my own. 
She was trying to disrupt my peace. She was trying to distract my focus on Jesus and the ministry that was in front of me. I will never know what her game was. I will never know what pot she was trying to stir or why. All I know is that I didn't want to hear anything else she had to say. So I said to her, you know, I said, I know what Jesus thinks of me, and that's all that matters. And then I said, you know, I got to go. My mother's calling me click. <laughs> you know, that was the last time I ever heard from her or from him. And whatever that's about, I don't know. But I'm so thankful that I dodged that bullet. Beloved, listen, don't fall for people who are working the phones. Look out for phone calls out of the blue from people who don't usually mess with you. Look out for, for people who try to drag you into yesterday's battles. There was a man named Shimei. He was a member of the household of Saul. And when King David had become king, Shimei tried to drag David into yesterday's battle. And David just rode on by and just ignored him. Forget about people who work the phones and work on yourself. Work on your relationship with Jesus. Work on your spiritual growth and maturity, on your Christian character, uh, on developing the gifts of the Holy Spirit flowing through you. Work on clarifying your call in Christ and getting equipped for it so that rather than being a burden, you're a blessing to the body of Christ. Five keys to being a blessing and not a burden. You doing all right? All right, number three, be your brother's keeper. Be your brother's keeper. Paul gives one command to the gaggle marchers here, but he gives two commands to the rest of us. We command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every bro brother who is walking out of order. If anyone doesn't obey our word, take note of him. Don't keep company with him that he might be ashamed. Yet don't count him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Beloved, I want to tell you, Paul issues to us the strongest command possible. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't get any stronger than that in the New Testament. And it's no wonder why he was so firm. Because what he orders us to do is probably the trickiest thing that we could ever undertake especially in the church today. And yet there are several directives from the Lord here that we must find a way to apply. First, it's important that we address the gaggle marchers among us. Beloved, I know I've learned the hard way. We can't just ignore people circulating among us who are disorderly and disruptive and disobedient. You see, I've learned through experience they're not just unproductive, they are counterproductive. They impede our collective progress. They drain everybody's energy. They suck the enthusiasm and motivation right out of the church. They distract leaders. They drain the body's resources so that there's nothing left to help people who are sincerely in need. In the Thessalonian church, there were some believers who were able to work, but they weren't willing to work. Instead, they were expecting the church to financially carry them. We're not exactly sure why this situation developed in Thessalonica, but Paul said, no, 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 we're not doing this anymore. God's family, they'll carry you when you need help. Thank God they're there for those times of need, but you have to graduate to carrying yourself. And then you have to grow strong so that you're able to carry others coming behind you who need your help. Paul gives a timeless truth here that America desperately needs to reclaim today. If a man is unwilling to work, let him not eat. You know, in 25 years of ministry, I've only seen a few rare occasions. You remember Wimpy? Do you remember? Wimpy, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. In 25 years of ministry, I've only seen a few occasions where a believer had unfair expectations of being financially underwritten continuously by the church. And when the church elders lovingly addressed it, those believers responded to uh, their correction. It hasn't been a major issue, honestly, in um, the places that I've ministered. Paul is definitely talking about larger issues here than idleness, but we shouldn't overlook a plain point to be made here. Christian discipleship and Christian maturity includes a strong work ethic. The Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, how? As 
unto the Lord. Beloved, I want to tell you that work is not part of the fall of man. Sorrow in work is part of the fall of man. But work itself is part of God's original intention for us. And work will be part of our experience in heaven too. The Bible says that we will serve God in ways that we have yet to discover when we get to heaven. But when we fall in love with Jesus, our work becomes part of the worship of our life. And now we work as unto the Lord. Directives from the Lord that we must learn to apply. Another thing I find. The responsibility for pastoring falls on everyone's shoulders in the congregation. Beloved, listen, caring and comforting and encouraging and correcting, it is not just the work of pastors alone, it is the work of everyone in God's family. In 1 Thessalonians 5, we looked at those verses. Paul said, the work of leaders is admonishing, is warning, correcting those who are out of step. And then in the next breath, he says that that's also the work of the whole congregation. What Paul is saying to us is, you are your brother's keeper. That means sometimes that you have to take the initiative to address a brother or sister who is veering off and becoming a gaggle marcher. You know, a lot of times the pastors are the last, time, uh, last ones who know what's going on. Please, don't ever ask me, like, when is something and what time does it start? I don't know. If faith doesn't tell me, I don't have a clue. The Lord shows me things in the spirit about people. I have dreams about people. The Lord, when I'm preaching, I see manifestations sometimes in the spirit over people's heads. But many times you are aware that a brother or sister is in trouble and needs a word of correction before we are. Take the initiative. And sometimes your pastors need you to stand with us when we have to give a warning or we have to correct a brother or a sister who is a gaggle marcher. Years ago in Philly, we had a young man on our church named Danny who had some pretty heavy-duty learning disabilities. During our worship, people often brought prophetic messages from the Lord. And I want to tell you, there were awesome, awesome things that happened in our church as a result of that prophetic ministry. But Danny started delivering messages at every service. You know, sometimes people get inspired in their souls. They mean the very best, but they bring messages that aren't really from the Holy Spirit. It just comes from a soulish place, from, from the uh, wave of emotion that they're riding at the moment. Our pastor spoke to Danny privately on several occasions and asked him to withhold his messages, but in the excitement of the moment every Sunday, it was hard for Danny to remember that. Everyone in the congregation was getting frustrated. His messages were disrupting our worship, and we were eager to hear what the Holy Spirit really wanted to say to the congregation. So finally, the elders met, and they agreed that if Danny spoke again, one of the elders would go over and gently stop him. For those of you who might remember my dear friend, Pastor Joe, who has the great inner city ministry in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, Pastor Joe was the elder at the time that was asked to uh, go and take care of that. He's a big teddy bear, loving guy. So the next Sunday rolled around, and the worship was awesome as usual, and just when it reached that crescendo, Danny started giving a message. And so Pastor Joe walked over very quietly and gently put his hands on Danny's shoulders. It startled Danny. He had his eyes closed, and he didn't see Joe coming. And so when Joe touched him, he just stopped speaking in mid-sentence. But I wasn't expecting what happened next. The entire congregation sat down at once. I have to tell you, it was impressive. It was they sat down in unison like they were a choir being seated by the choir director. And then you could have heard a pin drop in the auditorium. Actually, in hindsight, what we should have done is we should have just taken the offering right then and sent everybody home. I felt so sorry for my poor pastor because it was the worst atmosphere ever to have to preach in. Not even T.D. Jakes himself could have coaxed an amen out of that congregation after that happened. Everyone agreed that something needed to be done. Everyone wanted the leadership to act, but when something was done as delicately as possible, everyone sat down. 
It's not that they disagreed, it's just that it's really embarrassing when you see someone that has to be corrected in a public way like that. In the long run, everyone was happy, Danny was fine, no damage was done, and we went on, and, and the Lord continued blessing. But I have to tell you, it was a really, really painful Sunday morning. You know, the horrible awkwardness of that day has never left me. And because of it, I've always tried to operate on the policy of praising people publicly and correcting them privately. But you know, that's not always possible. And I've learned that it's not always best for the body either. Sometimes for the sake of sparing people's reputations, the pastors and the deacons and I, we've dealt with discipline issues privately, but it's left the congregation wondering what happened and why. And that's a mistake that we never hope to make again. But I want to say as your pastors, there are times that we need you to stand with us when we've had to administer a warning or correct a brother or a sister who's walking out of order. Don't sit down on us because the response for pastoring the congregation, it falls on everyone's shoulders. And I want to tell you, that's good preaching right there. Directives from the Lord that we have to learn to apply. Another thing I find, listen, this is going to help you, and this is going to speak to some of you about some situations in your life. God expects, listen, everybody catch this, God expects us not to exhaust our valuable resources on brothers and sisters who aren't sincere. Beloved, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, to sincerely love Jesus is to hunger and thirst to be like him. It's to worship him not just with our song and our dance on Sunday morning, but it's to worship him with all of our life. God is looking, Jesus said, for sincere spiritual worshipers. Paul said, take note of the, those among you who are walking disorderly and are disruptive and disobedient. Walking indicates a continuous pattern in their life. Paul is not talking about believers who are genuinely struggling. He's not talking about believers who may have stumbled and fallen. In fact, he said to us, use your own strength, use your own body to prop up people, believers, brothers and sisters in that situation. Paul is talking about people who have no desire and have no intention of genuinely submitting to Jesus. And Paul commands us to withdraw from such people. It's an interesting word that he uses. The word that he uses means to furl the sails. It means to close up the sails, to roll up the sails. Hard to know exactly what that should look like for us. In the early church, it meant to exclude people from the fellowship dinners that they had continuously in one another's homes. But we don't eat together like that practically every day the way they did. But maybe a helpful way that we could think about it is to stop making your valuable resources available to insincere brothers and sisters. To furl the sail means to close yourself off from someone. When a ship furls its sails, it stops moving forward. The sails are no longer catching the wind and propelling the ship. In the same way, when we realize that a brother or sister is not sincere about walking with the Lord, then our relationship with that person stops moving forward. To furl the sails means that we're no longer open to someone in the same way. We don't expose our hearts to them in the same way. We don't open ourselves up to their huffing and puffing that is trying to carry us in the direction they want us to go. See, when that girl called me from my church, all, all I did was I just furled the sails. And I didn't let her huffing and puffing affect my mind and my spirit and my heart and carry me in a direction that she wanted to push me. That's good preaching. To, to furl the sail means to withhold expending valuable energy on someone. Listen, I find this extremely helpful to know that I not only have the Lord's permission, but to know that I have the Lord's orders to put a little distance between myself and people who would suck the life out of me if I let them. If a brother or sister is insincere about pursuing Jesus and his righteousness, to quote one of the great theologians of our day, Tyler Perry, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> See, my time is valuable and so is yours.
My prayers, I want to tell you, my prayers are valuable, and so are yours. My counsel in the Word of God is valuable, and so is yours. My exercise of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, administering God's grace over people's lives, is valuable, and so is yours. My friendship is valuable. My fellowship is valuable, and so is yours. There's only so much of me and so much of you to go around, and ain't nobody got time for games. Ain't nobody got time for disingenuous quibbling over obeying the word of God. Here's what Jesus said. Do it. Directives from the Lord that we must learn to apply. One more thing I find. He is heavy, but he's still your brother. He is heavy. This is like, this whole sermon's the way back clock. If you're like under 35 or 30, you don't know what I'm talking about today, but he, he is heavy, but he's still your brother. Paul commands us in the name of the Lord Jesus to take special note of those who are continuously disobedient to withdraw from them. But if that weren't tricky enough, he goes on to say, yet consider him not as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Beloved, listen, the point of furling the sails, the point of closing ourselves off or distancing ourselves from someone is not to excommunicate a brother, it's to bring him around. The goal is redemptive. The goal is repentance and restoration. It's a lot like a family who is dealing with a member who has become an addict, is strung out, is lying to the family, is stealing out of the household, is endangering his life and, and the lives of the family members. Sometimes that family has to take the extremely hard step of exercising tough love and distancing themselves from the addict so that they'll stop enabling that behavior. If I might be completely candid, I have rarely seen this work in the church. Most of the time, church discipline results in a parting of ways, but that doesn't mean that we're no longer brothers and sisters. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep trying to find a way to make these instructions of Paul work. Because Paul is written with the expectation that they will work. And there's a magic ingredient we're going to talk about in just a moment. But listen, I have learned the hard way that to ignore disorderly and disruptive and disobedient people among us does more damage to the body in the long run than good. And that brings us to the fourth key about being a blessing and not a burden. Worship team, come help me. The fourth thing is this. If you want to be a burden, a blessing and not a burden, number four, don't get tired of being beautiful good. Even if some others aren't pulling their weight, even if some others aren't contributing to the body, even if some others won't serve, even if some others won't give, even if some others are draining resources, if they break ranks, if they go AWOL, if they desert the family, don't you get weary of doing your part. You see, when you're giving so much of yourself to make the church grow and thrive and succeed, it can be a little disheartening when someone next to you isn't willing to do anything. And worse than someone who won't work at all are, are those who are working against the unity of the church. But Paul says, don't you get weary. You keep doing beautiful good. Paul actually makes up a word here, as he very often does. He smushes the word beautiful and the word good together. And he says, don't you be tired of being beautiful good. Beloved, I want to tell you something. Your passion for Jesus, it is beautiful good. Your worship is beautiful good. Worship this morning was beautiful good. Your sacrificial giving to the church to make the ministries go, to, to make missions go around the world, to build phase two. I want to thank you. Beautiful gifts have been coming in. Good, big gifts have been coming in over the last couple of weeks for phase two towards our jump in campaign. I want to thank you for giving. It's beautiful good. Your service to his church is beautiful good. Ushers, you are beautiful. Richie, you're looking beautiful good back there this morning. Greeters, you're beautiful good. Security, parking lot ministry, you're beautiful good. Children's ministers, you're beautiful good. Especially the people changing diapers in the nursery. Listen, if you have a baby in the nursery, when you go pick up, I want you to just bless that nursery worker and tell them, man, you're beautiful good today. 
Youth sponsors, your beautiful good. Missions committee, you are beautiful good. Worship team, tech team, van ministry, you are beautiful good. Filipino fellowship, you're beautiful good. Brazilian fellowship, you are beautiful good. Messiah's house, you're beautiful good. Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha, you are beautiful good. Our Stanford Harvest campus, it is beautiful good. And listen, regardless of what others do or what others don't do or won't do, don't you get tired of being beautiful good. Five keys to being a blessing and not a burden. Get in step with the family of God. Work on yourself. Don't work the phones. Be your brother's keeper. Don't get tired of being beautiful good. And the last thing you have to stand for, would you stand up this morning? Now you're actually in the right position to hear the word of God. You know, in Jesus' day, the teacher sat down and the congregation stood. We ought to do that. Imagine, imagine how many more people we could get in here if we took out all the seats. We just had one chair for me and we could pack this place. We could save ourselves $12 million on a new building if we just took out all the seats. I don't think we'd have an overcrowding problem anymore. But the last thing is this. If you want to be a blessing and not a burden, encircle our church with prayer. I want to ask you to do something this morning. It's going to be a little tricky because the room's a little too full. But first of all, I want to ask all of our pastors to come and stand right here across the front, if they would, very quickly. All of our pastors, come stand. And this is what I want us to do. I want us to make two circles around this room. I want us to make one circle around this seating section and one circle around this seating section. I want to ask you to move out of your seats, move into the aisles. If you're close to the front, come to the front. If you're in the back, go to the back. And I want us to make two circles uh, around the church this morning. And we're going to just spend the last five minutes of this service together encircling our church, our congregation with prayer. You can do it. Thank you, Jesus. All right. You're looking good. Can you fit? Everybody stand real close to your neighbors. Guys, this is why we need phase two right here. There's just not enough room in the house. All right, everybody listen to me as best you can. Let me show you something cool. This is, this is a very difficult passage of verses. But I want you to see something. Paul, he opens and he closes this little section of verses with prayer. He begins and he ends with prayer. He encircles it with prayer. He starts by saying, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the perseverance of Christ. And then he finishes by saying, Now may the Lord of peace himself always give you his peace in everything. So Paul prays these very difficult instructions. He prays that God's love, God's peace, God's perseverance will saturate the entire church and this whole process of trying to restore disorderly brothers and sisters. Sisters. Beloved, listen to me this morning. Prayer is the magic ingredient that makes the whole church work. See, the church is unlike any other organization. It is unlike any other institution. It is unlike any other club or any other community on earth. The church is supernatural and it runs on prayer. And prayer is what takes a set of instructions that are otherwise ridiculously impossible and makes them feasible. Paul said, this is the word of God which works only for you who believe it. Take note of those who are disorderly, disruptive, and disobedient. Withdraw from them, furl up your sails, and they'll feel ashamed, and they'll come around and repent. Where could a strategy like that ever work on earth? It can only work where there is a church encircled in prayer. Paul says, pray for us and we'll pray for you. You pray for your pastors and your pastors will pray for you. I want you to know your pastors are praying for you. We're praying that you will become everything that God has called you to be.
We're praying that every inner desire you have for goodness from the Holy Spirit will be fulfilled. We're praying that you'll succeed in every faith venture you undertake for Jesus' sake. Your pastors are praying for you, and you pray for us too. Pray that we'll keep running swiftly with the gospel. Pray that unbelievers will receive our word with honor, just like you did, and that God will remove every obstacle and hindrance that stands in the way of our ministry. You pray for us, we'll pray for you, and together we'll encircle Harvest Time Church for prayer until it becomes the beautiful, good light of the world that God called us here to be. And we're going to close in the last minute or two of our service just doing that this morning. Come on, I want you to lift up your voice and I want you to just sing How Great Is Our God. And then we're just going to encircle our church with prayer before we leave this morning. Lift up your voice and sing with us. Great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. All of see how great. I'm going to ask my wife, Denise, if she'll start out on behalf of all of our pastors praying for you today. Come on, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you for the awesome family of God that you have created. Father, you gave your very life for this body, for each and every person that is standing here, and for each and every person that is yet to come into the family of God. And Lord, today we lift up Harvest Time congregation from the oldest to the youngest, Lord, even to the infant. Each one is infused and bright, just full of the destiny and the purpose of God. And Lord, today we ask that you would strengthen every member, every family member, that you would provide, that you would answer, Lord, everything that they need. God, that your name is I am. Whatever you need, I am today. Father, go into each home and put everything in order. Mend every relationship. Mend every broken heart. Lord, mend and give everything that they need today. We pray that you would make everyone an overcomer. Lord, you would send your healing. You would send your wholeness. You would send your peace. You would send your deliverance. And Lord, you would bless them as they come under your authority that the favor of God would shine down on everyone today. That they would be a light and a witness and that the glory of God, Lord, that would fall on their homes. Lord, I pray that you would make every member keepers of your presence. Lord, that we would become people that are full of the Holy Ghost. And when people come around us, their lives are changed because you are in us. Father, encircle your people. Encamp among them today and make them mighty for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our, our time is done, but we have to go. But just before you leave, let's just quickly encircle our congregation with prayer. I want everyone lift up your voice right now. And when you just pray that God would make Harvest Time Church beautiful good, that he would just make us beautiful good. If you don't want us to pray, just say, Lord, make our church beautiful good. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, that you've called us here for such a time as this, Lord. Father, we thank you that you put us here. Lord, you positioned us here in this hour in this place, Lord God, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to Greenwich, Connecticut, to Fairfield County, to Westchester County. Father, we pray that the gospel would penetrate, that the gospel would pierce, Lord. We pray that every high thing would come down and that every stronghold would be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for a change in the atmosphere in Greenwich, in Stamford, in Norwalk, in Armonk, in Bedford, in Purchase, in Harrison, in Rye, in Mamaroneck, in New Rochelle, in Scarsdale, Lord, in Austining, in Elmsford, Lord, Father, in White Plains, Father, back and forth, Lord, from Bridgeport, uh, Lord, to Brewster, Lord, to the Bronx, to Rockland County, Lord, Father, we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that revival would come. God, we thank you for the Greenwich outpouring. Now we pray that you'd pour out even more upon us, Lord. Father, 
Father, we pray, God, that you just release, Lord, everything that you've purposed for us. Father, we pray for phase two right now, Lord. We pray that you'd make miraculous provision for our new sanctuary, Lord. We pray you'd open the windows of heaven, God, and pour out on the families of our congregation. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd bless us with unexpected increase, Lord. We pray for inheritances. We pray for bonuses. We pray for pay raises. We pray for promotions. We pray for sales and commissions, Lord. We pray you'd bless every small business owner, Lord God, with a plethora of work, Lord, that accounts receivable would be paid in full, Lord, that debts that were written off, Lord, would be paid in full, Lord, and made good. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd let your grace rest on your people, Lord, to buy low and to sell high, Lord, and to advance in the marketplace. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray that harvest time would go forward like mighty rushing waters, Lord, that cannot be stopped, God. We pray, Lord, that every purpose you've established under heaven, Lord, for our church would be done. God, we pray you'd make us beautiful good in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a big praise in this place this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, everyone. Listen. You are